Hi, welcome everyone. Um, today I am here with Sean from SJH Photo and we are going to be discussing the Star Wars audiobooks and in particular the audiobooks for the New Jedi Order series. So first I thought that we could talk about really how we got into audiobooks. Sean has a lot more history with audiobooks than I do and specifically how we got into Star Wars audiobooks. So Sean, if you wanted to start. Okay. Well, um, Meg, Meg is being very generous, and what, 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 what she really means is I'm a lot older, and, and, and so <laughs> and so I have more history because I have more more, more time um, involved with it. But um, audiobooks has always been something I've enjoyed. So I used to have uh, the audiobooks on cassette. I, I was from a, I, I was from an area where they the library was actually um, they were disposing of all of their audiobooks on cassette and I mean the unabridged versions of a lot of audiobooks and I had some contacts of the library so um, they let me keep them because they were gonna they were gonna destroy them so I had so I was able to get oh like the Isaac Asimov Robot Empire Foundation series unabridged which again I don't think they were even released on a bridge on CD yet and this was the audiobooks for the blind. The regular audiobooks as well of the Robot Empire and Foundation, and so they were they had a, they had a few sound effects like more music effects than anything else, um, like that kind of like new age music that they would put in in different pivotal moments. But they were all heavily abridged. They, um, you know, you would take a, I mean, the Foundation series as an example. I think there were 18 90 minute tapes, so that's how long the unabridged one was, and the abridged one was were two 90 minute tapes, so they were really abridged. But again, I, I've always liked audiobooks. I was able to digitize all of my cassettes. I did that basically just in time. So I have, I think almost everything turned out okay. And I was able to do a little bit of uh, editing to the ones that didn't, you know, clear, clear up a little bit of the background noise so that I have them on MP3 and they're fine. But going back to Star Wars, I bought Heir to the Empire, the, the book, the physical book in 1991 when it came out. And, and I remember... I was over at my brother's house, who was just recently married, and usually I would spend time with him, and I wound up spending most of my time while they were doing things, just reading Air to the Empire, you know, and they are like, well, you came over just, just to read this novel, but I enjoyed it so much I couldn't put it down. And then when it came out on audio, I mean, I thought that was really neat. Looking back on it now, I mean, honestly, especially Air to the Empire, don't get me wrong, I love Wedge Antilles, uh, the character, I Dennis Larson, I don't know him well. I mean, I've, I don't know him obviously, but I mean, like, I don't, I don't um, know much of his work. But his reading is not very good. I mean, it, not only does he have a, uh, I mean, I'm not picking on British accents, but he has a very heavy, not just an English accent, but is it Midlands maybe, or like not a London accent, but his his accent's very strong and it's very indecipherable. On top of that, he's not a, you know, he's not a. I guess it's not his shield, but he he wasn't very good at making different um character voices mm. so so his, his reading was just kind of nah, not all that great and of course when uh dark force rising and last command came out they were read by anthony daniels who, d who did a lot i mean like if you know anything about anthony daniels he, beyond the star wars trilogy he was in the droids cartoon he, he did a lot of um of uh star wars stuff like, and his audiobook re reading was a lot better obviously his 3 po reading was spot on because he was 3po's voice but even his han and his leia they weren't, I mean, they were distinctive. I'll put it that way. They weren't the greatest, but they were distinctive voices. So I, I like I liked the way he did it. And then, of course, when Anthony Yield took over and he started doing the audiobooks, he, he's an audiobook reader. So he's um, he was very good at that. I, in fact, he's arguably my favorite audiobook reader even today. I mean, of the Star Wars books, he's my favorite, even though his books didn't have anywhere near the sound effects that Mark Thompson's do now in the modern, um, you know, he, he, he's a great reader. I'm not knocking him. I do like Enter the Yield a little better. And that might be too, because of nostalgia. I mean, like, you know, I was, I mean, in the nineties, I was still like in my early twenties and maybe late teens. So, you know, having that nostalgia might be part of it, but I do like. Yeah. I think for me, I have, I actually had very fuzzy memories of Star Wars audiobooks. My sister reminded me that, a few times when we went on vacation as a family, my mom would let us pick out some audiobooks from the library. And she said, we definitely listened to The Courtship of Princess Leia, several of the Race Squadron X-Wing books. So I, I know we listened to Iron Fist because Ton Fainan's death scene, I, I could sort of hear it in Anthony Heald's voice in my head. And we may have also listened to like The Truce of Bakura and a few other ones as well. But beyond that, I didn't really listen to a lot of audiobooks until 
more recently, I had a job with a very long commute where sometimes because of traffic, it might take me more than an hour to get from home to work and back. So I started listening to audiobooks of of Patrick O'Brien's novels, oh, all, yeah. all 20 of the Aubrey Maturin ones. And from there, I, I listened to some other ones. And, and now I've started listening to the New Jedi Order audiobooks as well. Yeah. Well, I'm the, I'm the same way now, of course, too. Um, you know, of SJ Photo, I own SJ Photo, which is a um, we we photograph youth sports and we do sports tournaments and we're <laughs> we travel through the U.S. and Canada, so we do a lot of driving. So I listen to a lot of audiobooks now when I'm driving. I, in fact, even when I drive to the store, I always have an audiobook on, but almost mm. always in my car. For a second part, I guess we've already touched on a little bit, but sort of the audiobook style then versus now in particular maybe like the bantam books versus the njo books versus you know the legacy of the force onwards once mark thompson started reading them well a large part of it of course is the different offers i, I mean different i'm sorry not offers different <laughs> um readers different voices you know who are who are reading the audiobook but beyond that too as time went on, they 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 had more of the um. They always had the soundtrack for the for the trilogy, but they used it a lot more as in the more modern times. Um, where at the Bantam books, you know, like if there's a space battle, they, you know, they might play like the Battle of Endor in the back. I mean, I mean, yeah. music in the background in the background or whatever. But there's always incidental music, and probably in the entire books when you get to Legacy of the Force of Fate of the Jedi, there there are a lot more sound effects. Like I mean, you know, back in the day. I don't think if there were any, there were very few. I mean, oh, well, really, the ones I can remember, honestly, from Anthony Yield's time, I remember if someone got shot, you would hear the you would hear the blaster bolts. Like, when someone was shot, they made a noise like, you know, <laughs> you know? And, and it's that standard noise all the time. It, it, it sounds humorous, but I mean, you know, there were a few sound effects, whereas now there are tons of sound, of sound yeah. effects. And then, too, even when it comes down to incidental music, you know, in the 90s during the Bantam era, it was always the original trilogy music because that's all they had. You mm -hmm. know, then after, of course, the, the prequels came out, even when we're going to the forward in time, they, they could still choose from the um, from, from the prequel music. Yeah. So, for instance, um, the, uh, the uh, courtship music from episode two, you know, they would use that for romantic scenes. They had, of course, with the uh, prequel music, there's the Duel of the Fates, which is, I mean, a brilliant piece, you know? Yeah. So, so they would use that music, or they would use the music of uh, Anakin versus Obi-Wan, you know, the music from episode three, which is, you know, it's a lot more of a gripping um, uh, music that's, that's appropriate to a lot of the lightsaber duels, you know? So they, they had more music to choose from, but they used it more, you know, like I said. And, of course, the sound effects, they used them more. And even with the... Um, the vocal effects to Mark Thompson's um, uh, voice, they could use, they use, they had more of that because when Anthony Yield was playing Aliens, he did a very good job of, of like, for instance, the Mon Calamari, I remember as an example, he really had a good, he could make his voice sound like it's underwater in a way. Mm -hmm. And he did that. And there were no vocal, there were no vocal tricks to it. He just, was, he was able to do that. And, you know, just like cartoon voice actors can do, they can make the, the size of their voice. But of course, with Mark Thompson, um, they used, um, different synthesizers or whatever it, trickery they used. Not that it's trickery, but you know whatever effects they they used to like make his voice higher pitch, lower pitch, whatever they needed to do for a different aliens. Going back you now to the New Jedi Order, so we're going to talk about that. We will be talking about that particularly. Anthony Yield um, stopped around 2000, 2001. So he only did the first couple New Jedi Order books. Then yeah. they alternated between Alexander Adams and Jonathan Davis. And honestly. Alexander Adams, his voice kept it, it was gripping, and he and, and and I could I could focus on the story with his voice, but he didn't really have a lot of range. You know, his voice was just very, um, it was it 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 kept you engaged, but he couldn't do different voices, and so you know he was okay. Uh, Jonathan Davis, in my opinion, has a voice that's very monotonous, and I don't think it's really conducive to Star Wars. I don't think it's like an action adventure kind of voice so i don't really like his his reading of star wars and um who did you say that was michael cumsey yeah michael cumsey reads he apparently just read like four audiobooks and then they switched to alexander adams i think he read balance point rogue planet another prequels one and then 
Um, I think the abridged audiobook of episode one. Okay. Well, Michael Kumsky to me sounded so much like Jonathan Davis. I did not even know that wasn't Jonathan Davis <laughs> until you mentioned it. Seriously, because um, if you listen to the credits, the after credits, they don't actually give his they don't they don't give his name. I just assume that's no Jonathan Davis one, and they're gonna go from Jonathan Davis to that, and Alexander Adams. And again, like I told you, I don't like Jonathan Davis reading, so that tells you what I think of Michael Kumsky's reading. Okay, so y- when you're ranking the new Jedi Order narrators, you're going Anthony Heald and then Alexander Adams, and then at the bottom is Jonathan Davis and Michael Kumsty, mostly because you, you couldn't even differentiate between the two. Right, definitely so. Yeah, so I think yeah. for me, I do like Jonathan Davis, but this is probably sacrilegious. I have to speed him up to 1.25 playback speed because he talks too slow and there's too many pauses. Once I got him sped up, I actually felt like there was a good clip going on, but at his normal speed, it was, it felt almost interminable at times, just that it was like, okay, go to the next sentence, go to the next sentence. But once I sped him up, he was a lot more exciting, but I mean, I I don't know what, I don't know what that says that I liked him not at his normal speed. Yeah, and then I think second, I would put Anthony Heald. I only listened to Vector Prime. I basically did like, I listened to Vector Prime, I listened to Balance Point, and then I picked up from there. So I only got one of Anthony Heald's New Jedi Order books, but I really enjoyed it. It felt, I guess I agree, it felt very nostalgic to me. Like his voice reminded me of old family car trips and... I felt like he differentiated between the characters surprisingly well. So he's he's in my second spot. Then my third spot would be Alexander Adams, who I found out is actually a pseudonym for the audiobook narrator Grover Gardner, I think, who has, he's read like 600 books under his actual name. Um, but he read, I think, like five of the New Jedi Order books. And... At first, I wasn't sure about him, but I sort of, the more I listened to him, the more I liked his books. It did feel like there wasn't a lot of differentiation between characters, um, which did make it hard sometimes, especially because in the abridgments, they'll cut out the, sometimes the so-and-so said, so-and-so responded, and it wasn't always immediately clear to me who was talking when he was reading. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then my number four was poor Michael Kumpsty. Um <laughs> I felt listening to Balance Point, especially in the beginning, it sounded really strange. Like his his accent sounded very flat and it was really bothering me until I started Googling him and realized that he's a British actor putting on an American accent, which I think explained why it just sounded off to my ear and I also had to speed him up I sped him up to 1.15 speed because I felt like otherwise it was just sort of dragging there weren't very many fe- I don't think there was only one female reader for a Star Wars audiobook ever in the in the Legends timeline at least and that was for uh Hammer Tom oh yeah oh. Yeah, that was actually, in listening to the new Jedi Order books, I almost wish that they had a female reader for Dark Journey, just because so much of it was Jaina. Yeah, that would have made sense. Yeah, and yeah. like, e- even even Mark Thompson, I feel like they they don't always get female voices, right? Like, for me, Leia has a very distinctive voice, because I... I think that Carrie Fisher had a very distinctive voice. Her voice is very low for a woman. And a lot of times the readers in doing Leia, they just sound too, like too high to me. I think I obviously don't know because I'm a woman, but I I'm guessing as a male reader, you're trying to especially differentiate those female characters. And the instinct is to make your voice higher when obviously like with Leia, that that's, that wasn't the case. That's not how Carrie talked. Well, the thing with uh, Mark Thompson, again, we, this is out of New Jedi Order, but still, I like his reading. I don't think that his that his um, his characters sound necessarily like the original characters, but I know who they are. 
I yeah. mean, like, you know, even though his Leia voice might not sound like Carrie Fisher, whenever he does his Leia voice, I know that's supposed to be Leia. You yeah. know, he doesn't have to say Leia said. And I think that his Han voice, Han Solo, I think he does Harrison Ford <laughs> to a T. I always really think that he captures him. But the rest of his characters, like Lando, uh, his Lando voice is not like Billy D. Williams yeah. at all. But again, I know it's his Lando voice, and I know it's supposed to be Lando. He even, well, 3PO, of course, has that, um, uh, you know, there's a sound effect with his voice to make it metallic. So, you know, yeah. you know that's, yeah. But again, I just feel like he's he's very good, at, even without the sound effects, he's very good at having different voices for different characters. Yeah. Oh, I should mention too, the, the yellow voice that he does really well is uh, Boba Fett's voice. But to be honest, you just give it a kind of a New Zealand accent. <laughs> I think, yeah. you know, I mean, it, I wouldn't say it, it sounds, ex- I mean, I don't know if it does or not. I, you know, I don't know his voice well enough, but the guy who played Boba Fett in the prequels, um, Tamara Morrison, I think his name is. He's yeah. um, he, yeah, he's a New Zealander. Um, you know, he did a very, you know, I think he's good at imitating that 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 voice, or at least, again, making it sound like Australian slash New Zealander as opposed to anything else. And right. of course, too, I wouldn't, you know, as far as that goes, Anthony Heald, I wouldn't, I can't fault him for that because Anthony Heald was playing Boba Fett as uh, Jeremy Bullock. Yeah, you know, from yeah, completely Australia. different actor. Right, right, right. He was right, but he didn't. He didn't try to put an Australian accent on because it wasn't. He wasn't Australian then. You know, um, I mean, the voice work was completely different. I don't know if anyone here is you know, young that they haven't seen the original trilogy before the special edition, but I'll tell you, um, in the Empire Strikes Back: Return of the Jedi, Boba Fett's voice was voiced by a different actor who was not. Who, he was actually English. No, I'm sorry. The voice actor was American. I'm wrong. The, yeah. the, the the guy inside the suit was English, but you know the voice was totally different. So yeah, it, that's why he, that's why the Jeremy the um Anthony healed Bantamera um audio books are going to sound different. I only noticed this in Rebel Dream was that Alexander Adams. It almost sounded like he was giving Jag a Scottish accent, which I hadn't remembered I from too. Dark you know- Journey. And then Jag, Jag and Jaina's plot line pretty much gets cut out of the abridgment of Rebel Stand. So I didn't see if Jonathan Davis was going to pick that back up. But I remember listening to it and being like, wait, it, this is Jag? <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's a choice. <laughs> I, I remember that as well. And I, 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 I remember thinking, well, that sounds odd, but I didn't, you know, yeah. again, I, I think possibly um, as far as putting on accents, because I know that even... Um, uh, Mark Thompson did this once with, with an alien race that he just randomly gave a French accent to. But, mm. but 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 I think that what some of the of the of the readers are trying to do is give alien accents, and the only way they can and, and they and it's hard to create just a new accent out of thin air. So they use um, nationalities. Even to be honest, even George Lucas did that. So I think that um, Alexander Adams was trying to convey um, that J- Jag had a chess accent because now do you know that from the New Jedi Order that he's yeah. he was. Just, he was raised so, with them. He was raised yeah. by them, right, exactly. So I think it's just supposed to be that. I don't think it's supposed to be Scottish, uh, per se. That's yeah. my opinion. Because I'd wondered it because from, from the audiobooks, I always got the impression that Thrawn had like a British accent. So in trying to do some sort of British Isles accent for Jag, it was showing, you know, the connection there that, that he was raised by the Chiss. Yeah, well, you know, I think Thrawn's, Thrawn's British accent in the in the audiobook reading, I think is basically supposed to be, because the Imperials always have a British accent, yeah. you know, um, so I think that was, was supposed to be, he, he's an Imperial more than he's an alien. Yeah, and then I just thought maybe we could talk, you know, any particular thoughts we had about any of the specific New Jedi Order audiobooks or the abridgment or things like that. Well, the abridgment... Um, yeah, that's always been a problem. The the abridger, the ones who did the abridgments, mm. they cut so much because there was only going to be a three hour um, um, uh, tape as opposed to six or, or or twelve, you know, or on a bridge, you know. So there was that. Um, as far as the New Jedi Order, now I think all of, well, we didn't really. Okay, I think there might have been some unabridged. I think the um, uni- Unifying Force was either unabridged or was heavily or was not as bridged as much. So I remember that being like a six CD package. So that's seven hours, let's say, as opposed to three. Yeah, but- I think Destiny's Way and the Unifying Force are like six hour audiobooks, but all the rest of the New Jedi Order are just like three, three, three and a half. Right. 
And um, the, the, the difference is with the hardcover books, especially star by star, it's, they just cut out too much of it. I mean, they, you know, that's, that's an action-packed book that really doesn't have a lot of fat that needs to be trimmed. And yeah. they made that into a three-hour story. And, of course, it's going to suffer. Because, you know, it's like taking some, something that a really good classic, not, not even about it being classic, but a really well-constructed book that's a long book that doesn't have a lot of fat in it to trim and trying to make it into a heavily abridged audiobook. It just doesn't work. Yeah, with so. Star by Star, what I noticed, the way that they got it down to three hours was they cut out everything but the Jedi Strike team. So, right. you know, we see the Voxen and we see them developing it and then it's on the world ship on Merker and we only cut away once to see Leia's reaction to Anakin's death, but the Battle of Coruscant was left out, the kidnapping of Ben Skywalker was left out, Danny Kui and Silgal's mission to jam the Yamisks was left out. Like, it, they cut a lot to get it down to that length. Right. And another thing, too, with, with Star by Star was, um, and I think the one Jedi... I can't remember her name now, but Raynor Thal kind of had a uh, had a crush on her. Oh yeah, it was like and, heiress or something. Right, uh, she right. had red hair. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> but no, but I think that um cutting cutting them out made them into basically like Star Trek red shirts. I know you you said yeah. you're not in the Star Trek. Do you know what that means by red? Star yeah, Trek red yeah, they're the yeah. expendable crewmen. Right, right, right. Yeah, the the crewmen you never get to know. I mean, they might as well have been the good guys of uh, the good version of the stormtroopers in the sense of like they're just you know you don't know who they are they just they're just jedi random jedi who die yeah and um you know in the in the book you actually really got to know basically all of the jedi and the strike team so you yeah. really felt 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 their their deaths and you felt that you know they had a backstory and their own lives and their own fears and hopes so kind of cutting that out kind of made um kind of made them into action figure um random people you know even even Oaha Kor, who you did get to know a bit more um her 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 death was probably the most impactful in, in the audiobook because they described that more but still you don't really know as much now again too another thing I think with the audiobooks as well is once they add sound effects especially for action scenes it it really does make more of a difference you mm -hmm. know because you know the, the music kind of grips you and then the you know, the blaster fire or the lightsaber swishing and stuff, you know, it makes it more of a of an interesting story. And again, too, like I said, I don't, I forget if you said you, you listen when you drive, but when I listen when I drive, having um, it on stereo, because some of those, are, they were they were in stereo. So when a spaceship is flying by or a blaster bolt's going off and it starts off on the front passenger speaker and ends in the rear driver's speaker, you know, you hear it like fly by you. As yeah. Well. Like, wow, this is excellent. You know, it's like I'm watching a movie on the radio, oh, well, it's like the old radio shows, or, or, or the, I still listen to a lot of the BBC radio shows, which they still make. It's like that, you know, it's really um, gripping as opposed to just, okay, you know. So the end, the yield, the Bantam era books, even with the sound effects they did have, they were they were mono, uh, they weren't stereo, they were, mm. they were mono. So the blaster bolt would be the same volume and it wouldn't travel as it were, you know, which again, it may not sound like a lot, but it, it, it makes a difference when you're driving in a car and you hear a sound or you hear it going from one end of the car to the other. It really makes it a lot more real in your mind, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like the audiobooks, instead of just being someone reading you a story, they sort of feel like a more cinematic experience. Because, exactly. you know, it's not just hearing the words of the story, but it's also like hearing the sounds, hearing the different characters' voices, hearing the music that makes it, yeah, like such a different experience. Right. And like I said, even even the sound effects that they did have when they were in mono, it wasn't it was like you're you're watching a 2D movie as opposed to watching a 3D movie where yeah. where you know, where the sound is traveling with you or, or traveling from one end of the car to the other. Yeah, and I found with the abridgment that it definitely worked better in some books than in others. Like looking mm -hmm. through my list star by star, I my main note was needed to be longer, heavily abridged. Um, right. But for some of the other ones, like I'm thinking of the Edge of Victory books or Dark Journey, I felt like it wasn't super obvious to me what had been cut. It felt like all the main plot points were there. 
And so I didn't notice missing subplots because it felt compared to some of the other abridgments, like a more coherent, cohesive story. Well, Dark Journey, especially, I believe, and again, no offense to Wayne Cunningham who wrote it, <laughs> but when I was talking about trimming the fat and story star by star, and I said there was no fat to trim, I think right. in Dark Journey, honestly, the abridgment is better because, <laughs> again, like I was saying, how I read them recently, like, you know, with the last year, 2020, but still recently compared to back in the 90s or, or early, 20, early 2000s, I think of Dark Journey, a lot of the book was sure, as it were. So cutting that out, I think, was good for it because I'm like, oh, this is a better story. Yeah. You know, I hate to say that, but that's how I feel. Yeah, like I'm, I'm just looking at my notes because I tried to take notes for each of the one I listened to, although it's hard since I'm not usually listening in a place where I can like immediately take notes. So it's like trying to take notes after the fact. So some of them have better notes than others. There were some bits like in Vector Prime where it seems like everyone takes a turn through Lando's asteroid belt. But in the audiobook, we only see Jaina. And while I miss getting to see Han and Chewie and they're sort of like the farce out there, I did feel like Jaina's was the most important run. So I could see like why they cut that out. Um, right. And then in Balance Point too, I felt like when I read Balance Point that the middle was really slow and bogged down. And I thought the beginning was good. And I thought the end was upset. Invested. Yeah, very invested in it. And the abridgment helped with that because basically a lot of those middle sections on Duro were like very much shortened. And it, it also seemed like in the book that when the Vuln arrived in system, there was all this flailing around where everyone's running around and they're trying to get like this laser and stuff. And that was cut. It was pretty much just like the Vuln arrived in system. Leia goes to get something and she's captured. And I, it felt like like an abridgment where I was actually glad I was missing all that because it felt right. unnecessary in the book. Exactly. That's that's exactly what, that's exactly what I mean. I think abridgments. Sad to say, I think abridgments work when the author of the original book puts too much fat. As I was saying about trimming yeah. the fat, you know, when there's too much extemporaneous stuff that doesn't really belong, that doesn't really go with the flow. It it actually d disrupts the flow of the story. And again, it's not good because that means the author didn't do their job correctly, in our opinion. But yes, the abridgment works well there because, you know, it's there and, um, uh, you know, the abridgments, I mean, I mean, it's not there. The stuff is not there. So it makes it a better story. Um, another thing, too, which we'll find, again, I don't want to spoil things. And now I am going to, I don't want to give a spoiler, but and the New Jedi Order, the very end of the New Jedi Order, before the final two books, um, they, there was a trilogy of books and they go into different things there. I'm not going to go into what happens or or anything like that, but just like we would, but I will say this, our heroes split up and mm -hmm. they cut out basically one of the storylines completely. Oh, wow. And, yeah. And the, and, and, and the thing is they only summarized it in like, a, I mean, this isn't actually re reading from the book, but they summarize it in like a five minute thing at the end, you know, um, and that, <laughs> I mean, so you, so, so you still know what's happening, but, that's awful, <laughs> you know. I mean, like, you know, you know, it's basically like. So there's a battle of Hoth, as we know, mm -hmm. and we know that Luke got away on the X-wing with R2, and they went to Dagobah, and Han, Leia, well, three PO, and Chewie are in the Falcon running from the Imperials. But let's just say that that the audio book of that, they go into in 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 depth of um, Han, Leia, Chewie, and three PO is like evading the Imperial fleet and so forth and so on, and then going into um, and then going to Bespin to get the to get parts to Lando, and they get captured. And then let's say that after they get captured, there's just a little five minute summary of, well, a after Luke got away from 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 the ice planet, he he trained with a Jedi Master, and then foresaw that that, that like his friends are going to be hurt. And um, against the advice of the Jedi Master, he decided to go and save them. So now let's pick up the story. And it's just like, wait, what? We missed all that? And that, that's kind of the way it, that's, that's what they, they did with this abridgment. And it's just, it's horrible. You know? yeah. <laughs> now, again, though, I do understand the reason for it. We, we, well, I mean, like to a point, I know that you actually had a very good, you did a very good video. I should mention this too, before I even go any further. And please don't edit this out, Meg, okay? <laughs> But Meg here, I really like her um, 
her uh, reviews. I like the way she has a very analytical mind that's very structured and very, very good at giving giving reviews. And she did, uh, well, it's not a review, but, but she gave a history of audiobooks and explained um, why the abridgment sell more and people don't want to spend a fortune on the audiobooks, so that's why they do it. So thank you very much for that, Meg. However, um, I don't know how much, well, I know that cassettes didn't really cost a lot, so they didn't have to charge $100 for an, unabr for an unabridged um, book. That's just, unfortunately, that's what they did, and that's why people didn't buy it, so they started abridging it, but they could have sold it on a bridge for the same price and still made money. And yeah. when, when we came down to CDs especially, I know how cheap they were um, to, to make. They could have made, they could have easily have put, started, like, let's say with Star by Star, w when they started putting them on CD, they could have easily put them as on a bridge and, and started charge $30 or 35 or whatever they were charging for the audiobooks at the time and still made money. I mean, you know, they uh, a CD was like a penny a piece. Even buying blank, blank CDs, you can buy a hundred spindle. I mean, us commercially, we could buy a hundred mm -hmm. of them for $20, you know, be, be, because I, I did that for a long time. Yeah. Again, as a stage photo, I made photo CDs for my clients. So I know how cheap they were. And we're talking about um, the people who actually produce them and, and like buy them in bulk, the audiobook people, they could have bought them for two cents a piece or something. And, um, you know, now granted, I know that they might have had to pay a reader more because as opposed to reading a four hour audiobook, they'd read a 12 or 14 hour. But even so, they would have made money on it. They could have done that. Yeah. So, I don't Plus, it always seems like they had to pay someone to do the abridgment. So, wouldn't have been. I mean, if even now, you know, you're not paying someone to do the abridgment. So instead you're paying to have the reader in the studio longer. Like, so then I guess finally to wrap it up, do you have a, I guess, a favorite of the new Jedi Order audiobooks in general? Hmm. And that's a question I actually didn't think of in advance. <laughs> a favorite new Jedi Order audiobook. Yeah. And so I think Vector Be Be Prime is probably my favorite book of the, of this trilogy, of, of the 19 books maybe but as far as audiobooks go probably vector prime still because i again i like anthony healed i like his reading and i probably have more nostalgia well i probably do have more nostalgia for that because i know for you, like with you again like i said me being older than you when you're talking about the 90s audiobooks you're like oh i remember the family trips yeah you know? so it has so there's that nostalgia for you because you were a kid in, in the 90s i imagine mm -hmm. now for me and that at that time period i was in my 20s and um i remember them as as trips also but road trips with my friends like we drove to the Yukon and Canada for instance which is um pretty far yeah. so I was already an adult but I do have that nostalgia for road trips too but very regular problem I think would have been in there as well I think that's probably around the time that because my friend Con got married in 2000 so yeah so that would have been while, while everyone was single and we could all just go and take a few weeks off and go somewhere yeah. you know so um well, literally we did that you know but Yes, I think it might have been because of the nostalgia, but also because of the actual story. I think Vector Prime is probably my, my, my favorite. What about yeah, you? I think, well, trying to think. I did really enjoy the audiobook of Vector Prime. I felt like it was one of the like good abridgments where I felt like it kept all the high points. And then I, I did enjoy Dark Journey as well, just for sort of the same reasons that it was like, you know, just the parts of the story that I was really interested in, Jaina's struggles, with the dark side and not a lot of the extraneous like hapen plotting that was going on I actually i think i might just i don't even think i need an outro like we just have an intro and that's good and i because i don't have anything scripted so next time meg will be doing another one of her brilliant reviews join us then <laughs>